Hi everyone, welcome to the Module 4, Part 3 video. Uh, here we are right at the beginning. I think this is the page that you should land on when you turn on your, uh, when you open up Blackboard. We're going to go down here to Module 4. Once we get inside of Module 4, we will end up going all the way down to Study Activities. Once inside of Study Activities, we will go to Part 3. And inside of Part 3, as you can see, is our usual three assignments. And then, of course, at the end, it says to complete the quiz. So we're going to go through this. This is Patterns of Thought. Um, and I am going to, this is actually rather fast. So I am going to um, go through this PDF, show you these links. I'm going to go through the role of memory here, and we'll talk about uh, the brain's potential. I'm going to talk to you about this video. Obviously, I won't be going through it but um, then we'll release you to take the quiz. Before I do that, I want to make sure that you are aware of the schedule of activities for the class. So I'm going to pull that up on the screen. Um, we are working on part three of module four. That'll be uh, the three things I just talked to you about and the quiz. Those will be due November 25th. Um, and I, I know that that's like the day before Thanksgiving or something. And so you know, I understand if you guys need a little bit of time, but we did not take a day off for Thanksgiving. Um, the next, uh, uh, sometime around Thanksgiving, I'll be sending you uh, the videos that cover Module 5, Parts 1 and 2. That'll be due on the, the week after Thanksgiving or December 2nd. And then that just leaves us one part of Module 5 and the final um, presentation. I do want to tell you, uh, this is, if you've watched the previous video, you'll know this is kind of a rehash. But recently, a lot of the assignments we've been working on, the results of these assignments end up onto the career presentation. So make sure you're saving these things. Anytime you do an assessment, um, please make sure that you are saving it and you will be adding it to the final presentation. Um, don't wait until the final presentation, till the week of. Go ahead and go to M5A3, open it up and start looking at it, get an idea of what we're going to be asking you for. Um, you might even want to just start kind of putting it together a little bit just so that when you do complete something, you go, oh, that's what he means. I'm going to go ahead and put that into the presentation. Um, you'll be way ahead of the game, I promise. Uh, December 8th is going to be the last day I accept anything. Uh, my grades are due the very next day on December 9th. So this is not something you can um, procrastinate on. In fact, everything has to be completed December 8th. You're welcome to get done earlier, but I just wanted to make sure that you knew that. Okay, so we're going to move over here to patterns of thought. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger for you here. Um, they do spend a whole lot of time talking to you about the idea of what is thought. Um, and we jump jump off into some philosophy here. You've got uh, your Greek philosophers like Aristotle. You've got your European, your German, French philosophers like Descartes, um, who came up with the famous phrase, I think, therefore I am. Um, thinking, thought, these types of things, they are a very profound philosophical idea. You know, the, the beginning question was always, are humans the only thing that can think? Uh, do animals think? And if so, are they conscious of themselves? And that's kind of what um, what the ultimate delineator was, is that we're conscious of ourselves. We're able to kind of introspectively think about ourselves. We're able to actually um, be able to say, I am able to think, therefore I am. This is something that a, a dog couldn't do. Uh, not that dogs can't think, and dogs are highly intelligent, but to be able to um, focus on yourself and understand that you are thinking, that's something that's unique to humans. Um, let's talk about thinking real fast. It's a mental process you use to form associations and models of the world. When you think, you manipulate information to form concepts, to engage in problem solving, and to reason and to make decisions. So this is like the mechanics of your brain. This is what you're doing all day with your brain. This is the brain's function. But thought is the act of thinking that produces thoughts, which arises as ideas, images, sounds, or even emotions. Um, it's a little different. One's kind of logical, not very creative. The other one is full of creativity and um, producing unique new things. So, eh, you know, many great thinkers and theorists have dedicated their lives to the study of thought. 
uh, some guys like Benjamin Bloom, who came up with the idea of, of Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, he chaired a committee of educators that developed and classified a set of learning objectives. And so um, this idea of Bloom's taxonomy, if you'll hear it a lot all through school, um, it's a classification system that's been updated a little bit since we first developed, or since it was first developed back in the 60s, 50s. But it remains important for both students and teachers in helping understand the skills and structures. So first thing I want to talk to you about is what are learning objectives. And these are things that the teachers usually set, although you can set them as well for yourself. But learning objectives are these goals, okay? Um, I have a learning objective for this particular assignment. Uh, I have learning objective for this particular module, and I have several learning objectives for this class. Um, the college defines them, the state of Florida defines them at times, um, and of course the teachers define them. Uh, they specify what the student will be capable of, and I love how that, that's future tense, what the student will be capable of, or what someone will learn as a result of being in this particular learning environment, whether it's just this one assignment, the entire module, or the entire class, or, the, or your entire um, program at the college. They can be divided into three main categories or domains, the cognitive domain, which you should know, the effective domain, which you should care about, and the psychomotor do domain, which you should do. So we're kind of going to break some of those down a little bit. Um, yeah, it, this, is, this is a very short thing here, and so we're just kind of going to go through this real fast. The cognitive domain is um, the, the idea of the complexity of the actions that you take your thoughts um, and it's Bloom's taxonomy and it's a reverse pyramid suggesting that the bulk of thinking or thought down here at the bottom is also the easiest. The easiest of these uh, six things to do is remember. It's also the bulk of what you do but it also produces the least amount of thought. Um, remembering is a simple concept, it's something your brain can do but it doesn't it doesn't create unique new things. It doesn't create new connections. It doesn't create, uh, it doesn't stimulate uh, the production of a new idea. Remembering is only, is one of the most basic things the brain can do. But notice as we go up, we get closer to create, which is one of the most difficult things the brain can do. But um, it is also one of the ones that makes the most difference. I, I guess that's the way I can put it. So as we move up, we, we of course have an understanding which requires some connective thought. It requires a, a little bit deeper level of thinking than remembering, uh, but understanding is um, is still low down the list and applying, taking what you understand and applying it to a new situation. Analyzing would create a, a requires that your brain actually starts to kind of synthesize new connections, evaluate same thing, um, you know, look at these things and you're able, these two right here are where new thought starts to emerge, new connections start to emerge, and this is one of the most unique things about our brains is that we're very good at making new connections. Um, I've been studying something called apophobia, which is finding weird connections in visual images. People see a picture of Jesus in toast or they see a, a you know, like a, a unicorn in the clouds or something. but what happens is is that two seemingly disparate pieces of information in your brain, which down here is just information, remember, understand, and to some degree even applies just information, but here you start analyzing and evaluating, and you look at that cloud, and you look at that cloud, and you go, man, that thing looks like a unicorn. You're pulling stuff from very distant parts of your brains together, and it's creating brand new connections, and these are, this is where innovation comes from and creativity. Of course, the hardest thing to do is to be creative, um, to create a unique new thing that's never been seen before, but that's something that, of course, is is really the goal. Whether it's art or literature or math or engineering or something along those lines, the idea of creating a new idea that's never been seen before, that's the very top of Bloom's taxonomy um, for a reason, because it's one of the most, well, it's one of the most valued skills, but it's also one of the most difficult things for the brain to do. So as we move on, let's kind of talk about these a little bit. We're going to talk about these. Now, these are upside down because now we start with remembering. And as we go down this list, it's going to get closer to creating. Uh, 
little bit more of an application of this Bloom's Taxonomy to, say, a college class. Uh, remembering is, of course, when you're skilled in remembering, you can recognize or recall knowledge you've already gained, and you can use it to produce, retrieve, recite definitions, facts, and lists. Here's some skill sets, you know. And up until, up through high school, even though as a high school instructor, I hate the thought of that, that this is how high school seemed, but it really is just rote memory. We teach you definitions, we teach you quick concepts, and you're just remembering them. Um, college is going to require you to do more with the information. They're going to require you to um, be able to take this information that you're now able to remember and store and do more with it further down this list. Understanding um, lets you get meaning from that information. I can memorize a list of names or a list of words, but if I don't get the meaning out of it or see um, you know, start seeing some connections between them, then I haven't done anything more than just remember. Understanding means that I've actually able to put meaning to the, the information. Each college course is going to introduce you to new concepts, terms, processes, and functions, and once you gain a firm understanding of new information, you'll find it easier perhaps later to comprehend how or why it works. All classes should seriously push you towards understanding uh, because we want you to build on your knowledge. But, um, you know, a lot of your basic classes don't because of just the nature of things. Um, but if, if you're tasked with learning something um, at, at a very basic level, you should understand it because that prepares you to apply it. So let's move on to applying. When you apply, you use learned material uh, in, a new, in new and concrete situations. Concrete being tangible things you can do. Um, in the real world, it's not abstract. In college, you will be tested or assessed on what you've learned in the previous levels. You'll be asked to solve problems in new situations by applying understanding in new ways. This is where the real connections start to come together. This is where you start the, this is the first winking inkling of creativity because you're problem solving here. And problem solving is a creative process. Um, you take information that you've learned and you apply it to a new situation in which at the very least you've never applied it before uh, and you've solved problems. And then everything past this is just a kind of a deeper level of problem solving. When you analyze, you have the ability to break down or distinguish the parts of material into its components so this organizational structure may be better understood. So now we're taking out of this information, um, this material we've learned, and we're able to organize it into our own personal organizational structure. We also call this scaffolding to some degree. It's, um, it's a way of connecting with, your, with you and what you already know. Um, and, and as a result, at this level, you have a clearer sense that you comprehend the content well, and you'll be able to answer questions such as what if, why, or how something would work. So these are this is a deeper level here. What if, or why, or how something would work is all of a sudden, um, we're, we're really getting somewhere in terms of, of being able to take our knowledge and do something positive with it. Of course, evaluating is you're able to judge, check, and even critique the value of material for a given purpose. This may seem easy to you, but the ability to do it and do it well is full of experience. It's full of expertise. And if you haven't interacted with the material a lot, you're not going to have the ability to evaluate it the way that we're referring to here. Look at some of these terms that we use to describe evaluation. Judge, assess, compare, deduce, uh, estimate, appraise, value, criticize. You can criticize anything, but to criticize things with authority uh, requires that you have a deep understanding of the material. So about, that's why evaluating is so high on the list. It requires a very profound understanding. And then finally we get, whoops, sorry, finally we get to creating. With skills in creating, you are able to put parts together to form a coherent or unique new whole. You can reorganize elements into a new pattern or structure through generating, plating, or producing. And when they say new, we're talking about brand new. No one's ever came together. It culminates with all of your experiences and your life understanding of things and the way that your brain has organized all the material. And it puts them together in a brand new thing that no one's ever seen before. And it's really awesome to be creative like this because this is where new things are developed. It's innovation, it is invention, it is um, just, this is, the, this is the outside of the box. And outside of the box is where success is found, okay? So you're gonna be doing all of this 
but I want you to understand there's kind of a the, the thinking and the thought ideas and processes kind of work their way through this. You know, most of us stay here at the remembering and understanding level, maybe the applying level, the most of the knowledge that we pull in. But if we really get it, if we're really able to synthesize it in our brains, we can start evaluating and even creating new ideas. And it may be something uh, as obvious as something in medicine or engineering, but it may be something in a, such a weird part of your life. I was a bartender for five years as I worked my way through college, and um, I started inventing new drinks as I got towards the end of my uh, time as a in that job. And, you know, that's just – that's the ultimate – it, it expresses that's the ultimate understanding of how to um, – of your knowledge of that particular subject. All right, you can explore these concepts further in the following video. Just, you know, click on that and go. It's from Louisiana State University and discusses Bloom's taxonomy with regards to student success in college. It is a fabulous video. It's pretty short, so go give it a look. All right. From Bloom's taxonomy of learning, you can see that thought and thinking can be understood as patterns. Um, there's order and structure in the way we think. As we look at patterns, we can also think about the power of thought. For example, the act of thinking, just thinking, can affect not only the way our brain works, but also its physical shape and structure. Um, there's a video down here. Where did the video go? I think they're referring to this video right here. Um, the, the video explores some of the discoveries which relate to all the thinking and thought involved thoughts involved in college success. So again, all this refers to this video, so go back and watch it. Um, and then there's just a little quick exercise. Again, I don't see these, so these are for you to do. But come up with three verbs that are associated with application skills. What are, what are, what are application skills? Well, Google it. Um, you know, it's is it more than knowledge skills? It's more than understanding skills? It's more than remembering skills, okay? What's another name for evaluation thinking skills? And then what thinking skills are associated with each of the following? And I want you to just put in here understanding, remembering, evaluating, analyzing, creating. Um, put it right in here. This is just to kind of test your knowledge. And um, uh, and that's actually the end of this. So how, how nice is that? Okay, so I've zoomed in on this page. Okay, moving down to the second assignment. This is called the role of memory. Um, actually, you know what? I wanted to show you guys a couple of things up here. Uh, when you click on this, you're going to learn about a term called metacognition. Metacognition is often defined as the process of thinking about how you think. Um, well, so right here, the first thing, it's, it's thinking about how you think and learn, is you ask yourself these self-reflective questions, which are powerful because they help us take inventory of what we are currently are in terms of what we thinking about what we already know. It's also, and this is the important part, asking questions about how we learn, uh, what's working, what's not. This is a constant evaluation process that you should be doing, especially if you are struggling, uh, especially if you are not doing well with a class. You can um, start looking at the actions that you are taking towards, uh, towards the class, and you might want to reevaluate how you how you are doing and how you're approaching the class. Um, here's some strategies. I think there's one more part, uh, and, and, and it's also where you want to be. So take a look at whether or not you feel like you're mastering the material. Too often, a lot of us kind of fake our way through a class, but what you don't understand, or you may understand, is that college is about building. So we learn one class to prepare us for the next class. And if you fake your way through the first class, you ain't ready for the next class. You know what I'm saying? So um, that's why we do things like use our syllabus as a roadmap. It helps us to understand uh, what the professor wants us to do. It gives us an idea of the schedule. Uh, access or summon your prior knowledge. We call this APK. Um, before you read the textbook, don't, before you even start, just put your mind in a thought process. Okay, we're about to learn about French history. So uh, what do I know about French history? Well, so far I know how to spell it, all right? But um, maybe you do know a little bit more, and you can just start getting that um, – in your brain. It's called priming the pump. It's APK. Uh, talk through your material. And I know this sounds crazy, but this is a truly effective strategy for metacognition. 
talk things out to your classmates, the ability to pull stuff in into your brain, move it around such that you can then verbalize it, is 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 integrating it or scaffolding it into your internal memory. Okay, it it can be your classmates, your friends, a tutor. It can be a pet. It can be uh, a teddy bear. It can be your cutout of Justin Bieber if you have it. But just talk your way through it. Um, I had a very long drive to the college that I attended, literally uh, almost two hours, and that was so useful to me that I almost looked forward to it because I was able to, as I as I drove, I was able to kind of talk it over. If somebody would had been hiding in the car with me, they thought I was crazy, but it is really useful. Start asking yourself some questions, um, self-reflective questions. These are some great ones. And then try brainstorming some of your own questions as well. Use writing kind of like you use talking out loud. Uh, but, you know, some people are good at writing. I have a friend last night who was just telling me that, you know, whenever he starts really stressed out, he just starts writing down his thoughts, and it really helps out. Um, whether you're writing or talking out loud, organize those thoughts. Maybe use a concept map, a graphic organizer. A great thing to, to see where your gaps are in, in some information is to just cold sit down and start writing out notes from memory. Um, review your exams. If an instructor gives you an exam back, oh my goodness, you, that's an absolute gift. Uh, especially if it is what we call a, a formative assessment, which is those quizzes throughout the semester that you take. Um, go look through them. Learn. See what you did wrong. Uh, if you can't figure out what you did wrong, ask the instructor. I don't understand why I got this question wrong. And I, just between me and you, I'll tell you about half the time, he'll look at it and go, huh. You know, that's a good point. I don't like that question. And he'll throw it out. But also, you can you can find out what you did wrong, or the instructor can point out where you had a flaw in your thinking. Those need to be fixed. Don't forget to take a timeout. I am absolutely all about taking timeouts. you got to have a brain break. Get up, walk away, go outside, take your dog for a walk, go get some fresh air. On a day like today, my goodness, I would be spending the day outside if I could. Uh, get up and go unload the dishes, go start a load of laundry, go vacuum the floor, but get away from it and go do something. It's a brain break and it's necessary. Okay. Um, testing yourself means that you are um, using flashcards. Hopefully you watched the video on flashcards a few weeks ago or some other type of sets of questions and constantly be refreshing your memory. Um, this is, if, if, if you've studied Ebbinghaus and the forgetting curve, this idea of testing yourself on a constant basis uh, starts programming it into your brain better. And then finally, figure out how you learn, which is important. That's why we've been doing all these assessments. Figure out what's the best way for you to learn. Are you a tactile, visual, or audio, or reader, writer? Where do you like to learn? You know, What's a good spot for you? Are you a naturalistic? Do you need to be outside? Are you a log logistical learner? Does everything need to be in order? Um, there's so many things here. So all these little assessments we've been working on, you need to apply them. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip these two things here and drop down here to the role of memory. But uh, consider um, uh, you know, reading through this material. All right. Moving along. Uh, the role of memory. You know how I hate these things, but let's just go through it. Let's start here with memory uh, and what it is. So this uh, this particular page from InfoGeek is really outstanding. Uh, I encourage you to read it all the way through, maybe even bookmark it so you can go back and look at it again. Um, it's a comprehensive science-backed guide to how memory works in your brain. And think about this for a minute. How powerful is your memory? You have two, you have more than a trillion synapses in your brain. And this is equivalent to two and a half million gigabytes or 2.5 petabytes of memory storage. Um, it is several uh, hundred thousand uh, terabytes. So it's an incredible amount of storage that goes into your brain. That's enough to hold 3 million hours of TV shows. And the thing is, as powerful as human memory is, uh, yeah, it's still, it's not, it's a couple of parts here. Is the memory stored? And if so, how do you access it? And that's a really, it's a really tricky part. But with some practice, you can kind of get better at this, okay? Um, so how memory works. First of all, how does memory get, how does information get into our brain? It's a three-step process. The first one starts with what's called a sensory register. Um, you are, you have five senses 
but those five senses are constantly throwing information into your brain. The first thing that your, inf your brain has to do is basically ignore as much of it as it can uh, because it's irrelevant. You know, do you really need to know what it feels like the inside of your shoes right now? Do you really need to know what it, uh, what the, the room smells like right now? Is it, is it crucial? You know, um, of course, a lot of the bulk of our information is visual and auditory, uh, but the sensory registers help you to um, kind of make a, yeah, it helps you to kind of make a um, differentiation. It filters. That's a good way of putting it. Um, and, and the thing is, is your nerves are designed, you know, you, the body is built that way. And only until the nerve starts really being stimulated do you realize, whoa, hey, something's not right there. Like you have a pebble in your shoe or a sand spur. That's when you go, whoa, I need to be careful of that because something's not right. So that's how sensory registers work. After sensory registers, it goes into what's called a working memory. Um, so the working memory is uh, your here and now. This is your, this is your almost as your consciousness and you're able to maintain a certain amount of information in your brain uh, in, their, in your working memory um, uh, to, to use. It's your using memory. Now it works two ways. Stuff coming in from the outside world can be stored temporarily in your working memory. Uh, if someone tells you a phone number and you know before you before you write it down if somebody calls across the room hey call this phone number and then you immediately dial it into the phone that's your working memory. It's right there. It's in there, and you didn't lose it. The thing is, is your working memory is only good for uh, you know like 15 to 20 seconds. I'll go ahead and say two minutes, really. Uh, but it's 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 very short. After that, if it has not been then transferred into your long-term memory, which is constantly happening, if it has not been transferred into your long-term memory, it is over. It's gone forever. And until you find a way to collect that information again it's gone forever it also works backwards um, you pull information out of your long-term memory and put it back into your working memory um, so here's a great example I will I can tell you my dad's phone number because it was the phone number I had as I was growing up as a child but um, I, I haven't looked at it in the last two minutes I really haven't looked at it on a piece of paper or any sort of document in years probably, but um, I can still recall it because it's in my long-term memory. Now, that means that at some point in my life it successfully got put in there and I practiced accessing it. Um, so I'm able to pull information out of my long-term memory, and we're about to talk an awful lot about long-term memory, but I'm able to pull information out of my long-term memory and put it into my working memory so that I can use it. That is recall, essentially. So we're talking about Storage and retrieval is the, the information between working memory and long-term memory, okay? So let's jump down here to long-term memory. And the, the, they're giving you an entirely different uh, example on this page, and that's good because I want you to be able to go back and look at it on your own. But um, my example of long-term memory would very simply be, I, I see it as like at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, there was that big room in which they had all these artifacts. You remember that? Um, that big huge room is how your long-term memory works. The thing is, is that you use information differently. Uh, all the information stored in that long-term memory, some of it's there, um, it's all there, but now the difficulty is you retrieving it, okay? For instance, if there was a box in that Indiana Jones building, and you know what, I need to show you a picture of it. I have recording all the time. You guys remember this room, right? You guys remember the, the the back of the room where they slid all that stuff and the arc went in there somewhere? Imagine that I like this picture. I want to pull it up. Um, yeah, we're going to do that. Imagine this being your long-term memory, okay? Now, this is every memory you've ever had, and it's there. Uh, you know, that's half the problem is did the memory get long-term put there? But when it's there, it's there. It's not going anywhere. But you can imagine that this box right here 
wow, hey, that one's easy to get to. So that's the important stuff. That's like my dad's phone number. I can walk right up to it. I know where it is. I use it all the time. This box way over here, buried down in the underneath two or three other boxes, that may be, I don't know, the middle name of my first girlfriend. Man, I ain't thought about that in 25 years. But it's in there. Now, what are the, which one's easier to find? The one I go to and use all the time or the one that's buried that I haven't used in a long time? It's still there, but I can't get to it. That's just how your long-term memory works. So how do we solve this problem? We practice retrieving. We practice going to the particular spot and using it. And so how does this relate to, um, how does this relate to learning? Well, it's very simple. Retrieval and use and retrieve and reuse, retrieve and reuse. It strengthens the neurons and the synapses and it makes it to where you are now able to go do it. Go find it pretty quickly. I, I can rattle off my dad's phone number like it's nothing. I'll do one even better, even though this, my dad's mailing address uh, has not, they changed them back in the 80s. But when I was a kid, I had a, a third grade teacher that made me write it every day. That was something she did for everybody in the class. This, this has disappeared. It's not been used in, well, yeah, over 40 years. But I can tell you that it's still Route 3, Box 3051, Okie Florida, 34972. Uh, don't ask me, but that's see how quickly I was able to go get it because I learned the pathway to it over and over and over again. And this is what you have to do with information that you're going to be using. Same thing. Um, learn to dig in and retrieve it um, uh, constantly. The more you do it, and it's just repetitions, and we don't like to do repetitions, do we? I did not like writing that. Every day we came and sat down and right after lunch and wrote down every day. I didn't like it. But, man, it stuck with me. There are some techniques that can help you out. Um, these are kind of like brain hacks. I don't want to go over them because I'm running low on time here. But the method of loci, this is a very old strategy. It's a mnemonic strategy. It's kind of like you visualize yourself in a house or something. The PEG system, same sort of thing. The major memory system, there's a video from this guy. He goes over it. These are really great. And um, they, with practice, if you want to, uh, with practice, you can do some really amazing stuff. Uh, I would personally prefer the major system in action. I've, I've seen it done, and people are able to, to really like um, do some amazing stuff with numbers. So there you go. I want to talk to you real fast about how you forget. It's called the forgetting curve, and if you've never studied Ebbinghaus and the forgetting curve, this is a great video on it. I want you to go through it. But it kind of reinforces what I just said about using the information over and over again. Ebbinghaus discovered very quickly that if you only learn something once and you don't interact with it anymore, within just hours, you lose almost 90% of it um, uh, within a, a, an amount of time. Here it says a month, but I've seen different reports. Uh, depending on what you learn and depending on the situation, it can be down to you've lost 90% of it within 24 hours. This is, by the way, also why Cornell Notes work, because Cornell Notes are designed to have you interact with the material three times, spaced out, it's called the spacing effect, spaced out over a 24 hour period. And on that third interaction, 24 hours later, you um, should have a great be beginning for understanding the material. So I want you guys to watch this video on the, uh, the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. And it's going to teach you an awful lot. And here we talk about the spacing effect. Now, the spacing effect means that it's called spaced repetition. This guy right here explains it really well. And, he, and I think we've used this video before. But he explains it really well and how you're supposed to, as you incorporate knowledge in, you kind of spread out the time between interacting with it. It causes your brain to remember it more. And if you fail at it, you go back and start all over again. This process here amazes me. I did something kind of like it in college, but I wish I'd had it refined to this point. I would love for you to watch this video, even if you watched it weeks ago, watch it again, because this is the spacing effect in wor at work, and it is incredibly effective, okay? Of course, context is, context is crucial. Without context, you don't have um, an, anything to hang the information on. So you have to learn to recognize the information and how it's important in you to you in context. Uh, context recall technique is a great way, <coughs> pardon me, a great way to do more learning. You also do better at writing what 
input instead of typing. I'm not so sure about that. I'm pretty good at typing. But biohacking, uh, one of the things this UCLA psychologist came up with, the idea is that you, if you write it down, like pencil to paper, it's a better, uh, it's better at remembering. It helps you to do more remembering. Just watch the video. They'll explain it. And finally, we're going to talk about nutrition. Caffeine can be a detriment to learning. Eating healthy fats keeps your brain healthy. Um, give your room some, give your brain some breathing room, uh, which means, which means that you you learn over the course of time. This is the spacing effect all over again to some degree. And then sleep. Oh my gosh, the amount you, you just cannot possibly really comprehend how important sleep is to learning. You must sleep on it. And it's just that simple. And there's so much information about it. Okay. Um, yeah, there's more here, but there's so much to, to learning. Please read through this page. It is really incredible. The, watch all the videos because you're going to really rethink the way you approach things if you spend some time on this page. Okay, this particular slideshow talks about how to like, um, this is like in a learning environment, like in a classroom, okay? So what can we do in a classroom to really improve our retention of the information? Um, so let's just jump right into it. Slide three says take cues from your instructor. I've been an instructor for 24 years, and I know that it just became natural for me that at times that I know something is truly important, that my inflection, my tone of voice, the things that I say, sometimes I say this is important, pay attention. But students that have been in my class for a while and paid attention, they can pick up on those cues. And that's a really great way to ensure that you are getting the most important things is to pay attention to the cues from your instructor. And, and they could be anything. It could be body gestures, tones of voice, phrases that they say, but you'll learn them. And the more you learn, the more you'll be able to pick those up. Uh, and before long, you'll be able to get them from a total stranger because they're kind of universal. Look for key terms when you're reading or when something's on the board in front of you. Um, and make sure that you have really focused on those concepts. Use summaries. Textbooks often have summaries in the in the back of the chapter. Uh, these are a great way to check to see if you grasp the inf information. Uh, and even better, if no summary is available, or even if one is available, write your own. Summarize it yourself. I promise you, it's going to be uh, an entirely different. Um, it's going to show you some gaps in your knowledge. Okay. Don't forget the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve and how that short-term and long-term memory works. Ebbinghaus and short-term and long-term memory, it all goes together. And it basically comes down to this. Picture in your mind the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark uh, um, uh, warehouse and how the best way to be able to find the information is to go to it often because you'll remember the pathway much easier. And that's about the best analogy I can come, come up with. Okay. Um, the more you do it, the more you'll be able to find it. The scary part is, is look at all of these boxes, okay? They, most of them just sit there, and this is exactly how your brain is. Most of them will just sit there, and you'll never use them again until one day you're going to go, oh, man, what was the name of that thing? And it's way down in there underneath all these other boxes, and you haven't practiced getting there, and now you got to find it. Can you? Sure, but it's going to take a while, uh, or you may never find it. And, and then the sad part is it's there, it's wasted, and then one day it'll just bubble up out of nowhere, and you'll go, oh, crap, I forgot what that is. So the more you learn, the more you mentally organize this, does this look organized to you? Not really. The more you mentally organize it, the more you're able to move around and use it, the greater chance you have of recalling it as needed. If I ever take a test on my dad's phone number and address, I got it, right? Even though I learned it in third grade. Um, start reviewing immediately, like within at least within half an hour after the class, you should review the material. This is quite often done with groups. Study for frequently for shorter periods of time. Instead of having one long cram session, break it up into several sessions, maybe one a day or two a day uh, leading up to the exam. This is a mistake that most people make is they, because they don't prioritize this class, uh, whatever class it is, they then save it until it's too late, and they look around and go, oh, man, I haven't studied. Holy cow. And so now they're down to needing to study for four hours uh, right before the test, and it's far less effective. 
and then don't forget the repetition. Repetition is putting information into your long-term memory, retrieving it back in your short-term memory and using it, and then putting it back in. Um, and that basic brain model, it is not fun. One day we'll all have USB ports in our brain and we can learn like Neo did in the Matrix, but until then, this is the best way to get it in and out of your brain. Strengthen your memory by incorporating visuals, creating mnemonics. If you don't know what a mnemonic is, it's things like Roy G. Biv, which stands for the order of the colors in the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. You um, <clears throat> you know what PEMDAS is. You know what please excuse my dear Aunt Sally means. These are mnemonics, and there's tons of them. You can actually even Google mnemonics. Okay? Again, get quality sleep. And as you can, and this is a little more of a conscious thing, but as you can, Connect new information to old information. It is scaffolding, and it is the way that your brain works. And once you're able to take existing information from your experiences, whether it's academic knowledge or just life experience, and then connect this new information to it, it's now in there, and it's done. And it's the pathway is easier to get to, okay, because you're already familiar with the pathway. All right? Memory relies on effective studying behaviors like choosing where you study, how you study, and with whom you study. And that is a huge, important um, uh, thing to think about are those three things. Uh, where you study, how you study, and with whom you study. Okay, the very last part here is this video. Um, this is by a guy, I think he's trying to sell you a training. I don't know, maybe a new, I don't know what he's trying to sell you. The good news is, is once you get past that, and the guy's kind of a, I think he really loves to look at himself in a mirror. But when you get past all that, pay attention to what he tells you about how the brain works, specifically the amygdala. And then there's a discussion in here about hacking the amygdala. And I'm telling you, this right here, this stuff is really good. So watch it. Watch it again. Um, it, it, it talks a lot about what we've already covered. But this is like the ultimate in... How to learn and yeah it's pretty crazy after that you go do the quiz and that's everything for module four part two so um good luck with everything and i will see you next week